unfortunately, not everybody manages to get through something, you know, yes, and yes. I've learned this the hard way. And, um, but I guess it's just, you know, there is points in your life where you get to, uh, you know, to, you get to a wall and then you, you know, either you have someone that accompanies you, like you had your osteopath to say, okay, that's it. You take a break, right? Or you hit the wall and you hit it again and again until you, you find yourself sitting on your bum and then you have to, you know, rethink what is it you're actually doing, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's so interesting. You said we get through it. Yes, everyone gets through it somehow in maybe different ways, you know. Maybe some, sometimes it takes a long time. And I think what, what it comes down to is actually you, you have a decision that you can make. And you can make a decision every day. You can take a bigger decision, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, so interesting. I've, I've been um, doing this, this uh, certification and it's based on Alfred Adler. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with Adler. And, um, you know, he, he basically said it is, you know, it's not always like this is what you're born into this is what you brought with you and um this is something that runs in the family um, but he says that it's actually up to the person to decide how they want to live how they want to live their life how you know something happens and it's up to you to decide what do you do with this is this gonna break you or do you decide I'm going to live through this and I'm going to live with this, you know? Many people have this thing of, you know, yeah, this runs in my family. I have a problem with this because this is, you know, it's hereditary. Mm -hmm. I'm more and more, you know, yes, there are, I'm for sure certain things that are hereditary, but we still can take a decision how we deal with it. I think it's not either or. Mm -hmm. I think it's end. Mm -hmm. We have a system in which we live. Um, we have a family system where we came from. We have ancestors that left information in our DNA. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is, I mean, when people say it runs in the family, I can, I can name you a couple of things where I'm saying it runs, runs in my family. Mm -hmm. in the female line it's there um and then the second part is what you say and then i take a decision mm -hmm. do i want this to stay in the family system do i want like that my daughters inherit this behavior or that belief system mm -hmm. or does it stop with me yeah. I think that is that yeah. is what you dis, yeah. what would you call the decision because there, there are moments when I can do systemic work and I say this finishes with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fully agree. Absolutely agree. And and yeah, you know, we have ancestors and we have a society, you know. I mean, we as human beings are transporting something you know, that has been there for a very long time. And it's, it's quite interesting to see it right now with everything that's happening. You know, fear. Yeah, fear of death, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do sometimes wonder, has that always been that way? Or is this something that humankind has learned? over the centuries because it has been maybe instilled you know the church apparently in the bible there was uh, not a negative connotation at some point um, mm -hmm. about death so uh, you know one wonders what does the church have to do with you know imposing this if you don't do this you get to you go to hell so mm -hmm has a lot to do with fear, the development of fear, 
put a society in a situation like that and people being scared, mm -hmm. you know, I'm being punished if I do something. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. I think, I mean, fear of death is the ultimate fear. And yeah. I don't think any other living being is probably going there. Um, I guess the question is a question of consciousness, right? Yeah, yeah. And that started basically with us. Yeah. And maybe with that consciousness, we... Sometimes I wonder if the consciousness is a little bit too much for our brain. <laughs> you know, that we have to yeah. construct systems to cope with the actual consciousness to cope with what we're thinking and what we are then imagining yeah. that what could be or what could happen so sometimes i wonder if if we just why we're so fearful you know i mean there's so many practices there's so many modalities to to help us um through the day to live with uncertainty with change why is that why why do we need so much help with that why are we fearing change uncertainty so much what do you think i wonder if you know this fear of death what it comes down to you know, what do we fear in the end? What is the worst that can happen? You know, if we take it very simply in terms of a person in a career, you know, why do they have anxiety? I'm not good enough. I won't find a job. If I don't find a job, I'm not going to be able to provide for myself and my family. If I don't provide for the family, maybe I get sick. I can't cope with the costs for that. I think ultimately it all comes down to the same thing. Mm. It's this fear of not being able to survive. Mm -hmm. The same for, you know, all of us is the fear of being excluded. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm excluded, ultimately I won't be able to survive. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, I always admire persons, you know, the yogis and people that say, oh, you know, I want to be able to go and live on my own in the wild. But I don't know how it is for you, but I've experienced traveling by myself and I loved it. But the hardest part was always I couldn't share it. I couldn't share my emotions in a particular moment, you know, when I saw something that was so overwhelming and so beautiful, you know, that's the thing. It becomes even stronger when, when you can actually share it with someone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's this fear of, of not surviving maybe with everything there is. And you made a very interesting point you know when you said oh maybe our brain is not made to cope with all of this it's interesting right because we know today that we're using such a small part of our brain so maybe you know maybe the answer lays in you know we have to find a way to actually learn and using more parts of our brains or maybe we have to learn to connect better I'm I'm on the path of learning learning to trust and to have kind of a faith that I'm connected that there's something some energy uh holding it together where I can kind of like in my in my little insignificance lean with a shoulder and say it's okay it's a tough day or it's a tough week. It's, it's a tough situation. Uh, it's a tough disease. It's, it's a hard decision to take, but that sort of sense of it's okay. 
there is something, you know, that is what I'm trying to learn that I struggled a long time with the word surrender. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, surrender also means letting go of that idea that I'm only in charge Mm -hmm. and that I have to take all the decisions. And that's the ego part of me talking. That's clear. But to say, well, if I let go and if I go with the flow, and that's also what you described, you know, going with the flow, feeling naturally into what feels right Mm -hmm. and allowing for that to take over and me just to surrender. That's what I'm trying to learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's a big Big objective. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it is. I mean, and, the, it, you know, it's a lifelong learning, I, I guess. I, I understand exactly what you say, you know, this surrender. Um, I don't know. I didn't mention this before. In 2012, I had a um, snowboard accident. And it was not let's say you know i didn't break my neck luckily but i must have hurt my neck quite strongly and um i kind of like almost lost balance so i had very strong after effects i couldn't fall asleep anymore and you know falling asleep somehow is also a bit of a letting go of surrendering right and it's quite interesting to watch my boys right now if they have a lot going on it's hard for them if we don't manage to like you know accompany them to to work through their day what happened etc they struggle a bit more in the evening to let go to surrender in the end because it's almost like you're going into this unconsciousness into sleep right and in 2012 i have to say it was over a year that i struggled after this accident i had very strong dizzy spells sometimes i couldn't walk straight on the street i felt like i was falling over um i couldn't fall asleep anymore which was terrible because it was i went for weeks without sleeping and the worst for me is and i remember i've I've been to an osteopath as well and he would say, just let go, just let go. Nothing can happen to you. And for me, because the more I felt dizzy and, and I had this strong pain and oh, it was just awful and I could not understand what does this person want to tell me? I've been through rehabilitation even and it was like this, this bad situation of not being able to explain to anyone what is happening, you know. I didn't break anything, and they kept telling me, yeah, but if you'd break something, you'd have to recover as well. I said, yeah, but, you know, I don't, I don't understand it, right? And what happened is I tried to hold on, you know. The, the harder it became with the pain, with the dizziness, you know, the more I held on, and I couldn't let go. So this, exactly this thing of surrendering, you know, and then that was that year that I found out about mindfulness training. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that saved me. It really saved me because that was exactly what I learned. I did like a, a almost eight weeks training, you know, every day to go through this exercises to just, okay, just recognize there is this is how i feel i feel the pain feel the dizziness you know i'm not feeling so great however it's okay it could be there i don't need to change it Mm -hmm. so yeah so i can very much understand you know i mean i still have situations and i still find myself in this oh no i have to hold on i have to hold on surrendering is a very big thing very big this is how i became aware of you i saw something on linkedin where you were holding the baby version of the big one you see i like chocolate i can't go for this one (laughs) Uh, tell me how you came 
to describing your job using a surprise egg. Now, I was doing this masterclass and when I started the masterclass, you know, I was still in this struggling situation of, oh my God, every marketing professional I spoke to and a lot of people out there, you know, that I had conversations with, you know, when I try to explain to them what it is I'm doing or what it is that I want to do, they all, you know, try to push me and they steered me. Some of them did it very subtly, you know, you couldn't really realize it right away but it all came down to what do you like most about these things that you describe and i said i i can't tell you what i like most because that would mean i would just leave the other two things aside and that's not right because i'm a full package i come with all of this because I'm basing the services that I'm trying to, you know, provide for my clients on this experience. And it's all connected. It's all connected. You know, I mean, I love people. Mm -hmm. I really love people. And I love to work with people in developing them, you know, trying to help them work on their confidence. Because what I learned as well in my 16 years of experience, it it is actually very simple. Like people, you know, you, you said with uncertainties, we're struggling with uncertainties. We're struggling with, um, you know, not finding our way, what are our fears, etc. In the end, it comes down to the building of confidence. Yeah. And that's where my part also comes in as well is, confidence and you need structure as well to be successful okay so you know in the end my my let's say my circle that i'm drawing is from my experience working in industry right where i was um, doing employer branding so i was a lot in contact with universities with students it was about you know building the brand of the company and attracting the right people so speaking of people Mm -hmm. right so that's one thing And then the other side is the industry. It was always this technical environments. Mm -hmm. Um, I've graduated from a technical high school. And um, I mean, that was also one of these decisions in my life that I just took. It just came. It just pulled me. It just came out of my belly. It was never this, I want to do, you know, a technical high school. I actually started the economy high school. And after two weeks, I I went home and I told my parents, you know what, like these teachers are just not for me. I don't like him. They're not like, I remember a French teacher. Oh my God. I was like, I'm never going to learn French like that or continue learning French. So, you know, my sister was like, okay, how about you go to the technical high school? It's just across the road. And I'm like, yeah, but we're two weeks in. She's like, okay, I'll just give my former um, teacher a call and, you know, Boom. Two weeks later, I changed over, you know, it was, uh, it was one of those, you know, one of those decisions, right? Before you go further, let me yes. just sort of like, where or what strength helped you or what trade helped you to actually be able to make that switch? Hmm. It's, um, I think it's a combination of more things. Mm -hmm. The one thing is this being spontaneous Mm -hmm. and maybe it's a bit of adventurous. Then it's the flexibility probably, you know, and you mentioned that before this, just this undescribable feeling. It's just, okay, okay. Just do it. Mm. Just do it. So I don't know. I mean, what, what st- is that a strength? Is that something innate? I don't know. I can't tell you. Um, well, were you always like that? I was definitely someone that always tried out things. Like I was fearless. I think even as a child, you know, now, now with my two boys, you know, I remember, oh my God, I remember telling my mother, oh, you know, 
you don't have to be so strict and that's fine and I can take care of myself. And, <laughs> and now I'm thinking, if my two kids would do what I did, I would go bonkers completely. And um, so, yeah, I guess I always had this motor, let's say. There is, there is this engine running in me, you know, and it's just this... Yeah, I describe myself as I'm, I'm a possibilist. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm an optimist, I'm a pessimist. That depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's actually really this, there is always a possibility. There is always a way. My husband one day um, said, you know, you're, you're just like this little click, 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 you know, it's like there is a problem and you just start da -da 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 clicking and, and you always look and you, then you look more and then you look more. So this is a bit the opposite of this surrendering, mm -hmm. right? So this is this one trait. And, and again, I think it has a positive side and it has a negative side, right? Um, and, and for sure, I believe it also has to do with my upbringing. You know, I told you I, I was born in Romania um, at, as this um, Saxonian minority, which German speaking uh, minority mm -hmm. in Transylvania. And, you know, growing up, it was, you know, it, it was like this, this society within the Romanian society. So I went to a German kindergarten. I went to German school. High German was my mother tongue. That's how I grew up with. And we lived in Romania. And, you know, we were always the others, right? There is a German and a Hungarian minority in Romania. And there was always a bit of this, this let's say, separation because my family was split. You know, I had an uncle in, in Germany and then Switzerland. And then my grandparents moved after 13 years. They waited for their passports and then they were able to move to Germany. And I grew up as a child with this idea of, oh my God, Germany, that's, that's the dream country. The lights are on all the time, even in the night. <laughs> And they have running water and they have warm water coming from the tabs. And, you know, I was 11 years old when the revolution happened. It was in um, 18, 89. 80, 89, 90. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then 90. And then right after, uh, you know, we got our passports and we were able to leave the country within five months, right? So we moved to this country where you could go to a supermarket and they actually have stuff in there. It's not just flour, oil, and cans of things, right? But, uh, you know, I still remember the smell of walking into a supermarket. Mm -hmm. So until today. So we moved to Germany and we're Germans by passport. Mm -hmm. But it's like you're all of a sudden you're in a different culture. You think you are, but you're not. It's not your culture. And you're considered, ah, oh, those are the Romanians. But we're not Romanians. And in Romania, we were, oh, those are the Saxonians. Mm -hmm. So we're not Romanians either, right? So, so I guess this is also, you know, this is probably something that shapes a person as well. It shaped me, you mm -hmm. know, because, I mean, that, that is also my nature, like this constant movement, moving, you know, the older I get, I realize I get, I calm down, which is great <laughs> because I realize the energy level is not the same anymore. Right. But you know, and then, yeah, it's like this decisions we, we started off. How did I take this decision? Mm -hmm. what, what led me to do that? And, and I guess it's this, this constant, yeah, well, I don't like this. So I just have to try something else. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to just sit here and be miserable. So then I'm just doing that, you know? And, and I guess that's, that's how it went, you know, and how I, I took the decision, you know, I graduated from high school and then it was like, okay, so what do I do? Um, oh, I loved welding during my high school. So I used to spend quite some time, you know, searching for old car par uh, parts and then basically weld them together with the gas shield welding. And, um, oh my God, I mean, a poor parents and friends and my sister who basically got like for Christmas, they would get the sculpture, you know, a table out of, you know, car springs and the, 
and the tires on them and oh my god yeah so i had the I, this idea that oh i'm really creative so i i'm going to be an artist i'm going to study arts and then high school finished and my sister had the opportunity to go to toronto and i was like ah oh, you know what i just go i come you know, I looked for a job and it's a great opportunity. I'm just going to learn English. And, and then I was a waitress in, in this bistro. And one day the cook didn't show up anymore. And my manager looked at me. He's like, can you cook? And I'm like, <laughs> I can try. <laughs> and wow, doc, I became the cook of the bistro. And, you know, his, his mother-in-law, who was this little Italian woman who was speaking Sicilian, um, basically taught me how to do arancine and, you know, the whole pasta dishes. And, well, you know, that's how I took a decision. Okay, I can try. Let's do it, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, yeah, so, so that's how it goes on and on and on in the end. Um, yeah, maybe it is some sort of a confidence that just comes from, you know, just going through the experiences. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fine. We're going to manage her to get through it. I certainly came to points, as I told you, you know, with this accident in 2012, mm -hmm. that that was very difficult for me because I could not manage it. I didn't have control over what was happening to my body, right? So yeah, that was a challenge and, and I managed to go through it. But tell me what a surprise egg has to do with your work. All right. Well, I don't know if you remember it, that in, in German, that was the Spannung, Spiel und Spa, Schokolade. Mm -hmm. There was these three things, right? Yep. So it is like, because I have these three things I'm offering, right? I'm doing the coaching, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the career coaching specifically, right? Then I'm helping companies with the employer branding. And then project management, because that's what I've done. Like since, I don't know, it was even in middle school, right? I was the project manager. I was the organizer of things. I put structures in place. Mm -hmm. I found possibilities and I, I worked through problems, right? So actually that was, it's just simple as that, right? I had these three fields that I want to provide services with to my customers. And, and I wouldn't want to let go of one of them. You know, the surprise act combined three things. Why can I not combine these three things? Because they make sense. It's all together. And then, you know, I'm combining these three services, but I also combine, you know, my knowledge, mm -hmm. my experience, you know, all my certifications that I've done with my personality. And that, that's what makes me unique. Because, mm -hmm. yes, there is thousands of coaches out there right? There is thousands of, you know, employer branding specialists, recruiters, project managers. But the uniqueness is right here. It's in me. It's with my experience. I come as a package. So mm -hmm. if I would let go of one of these fields, this is like I would chop off part of me, which I don't want to do. So that's it. And, and it's so interesting because when I found this, you know, this egg analogy it all went like ah, okay i'm good i'm fine like this i don't have to change anything and i don't have to be a coach only because let's i mean let's be honest i don't think i would be a happy coach if i would be just coaching right because i need also i need this other stimulus as well because i love people you know Mm -hmm. It's like, I love to work with people, not only on their topics, but also in developing them. And that could also be, you know, because I, I keep speaking about the confidence and the structure, because what I realized, the three fields of customers have something in common, right? They all want to feel safe and secure, and they want to have confidence, so the people that come for coaching, they want to feel confident that, that the decisions they're taking or the, let's say, the next step that, are, that they're doing is a good one. 
So once they feel or they understand what their strengths are and what it is they really love to do, they feel confident. And when they're confident, they can position themselves much better. Mm -hmm. So the same actually counts for, you know, you have a mid-sized company that struggles to attract people from the STEM, um, you know, areas, mm -hmm. which is the science, technology, et cetera, et cetera, which is an issue. It's a huge issue in Switzerland at the moment, right? So what is it that this person or let's say the owner of a company like that needs? They need confidence that they have positioned the company in the right way that attracts the right people. So this is why I help them, you know, understand what is your brand? What is it that you actually communicate out there? Because most of the mid-sized companies actually don't really actively work on their employer brand. Mm -hmm. Employer branding is not only positioning yourself towards potential candidates, but it's also um, including a lot of how do you treat your employees because they are ambassadors of your company. Especially now in this situation, there is a lot of companies who unfortunately have to, you know, make cuts. Mm -hmm. And how do you let people go? How do you accompany them? Mm -hmm. That is a huge employer branding point. These people talk to friends. They talk to new colleagues. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of what is being said about you? You know, branding, we talk about personal branding is, you know, what do other people say about you when you're not in the room? It's the same for employer branding. What structures do you have in place? What activities do you do? You know, the whole digital world most of the small companies, they don't actually have a dedicated person to do that, yeah. you know, to work on their LinkedIn, to work on Glassdoor, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this is where I actually come in. I help them by, you know, analyzing, trying to focus them and then showing them this is how you could do it. Or I can support you to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the last part with the project management, it all comes together. Right. Yeah. It all comes together. I've run in 2014. I was the project lead for a newly created um, event, which was the Long Night of Careers in Switzerland. So we decided, you know, in the, in the high school, in the um, universities, we have to do something different. You know, this, this career fairs is so tiring. You know, the companies feel they have to come because they have to be present, but you know, I know how it is from a company perspective to stand there for three days in a row and answer the same questions, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why we came up with the idea, let's do something else, right? Let's take this whole career fair thing and place it into the evening, you know, and meet on a different level hmm. where it is student after university, a company representative after the day of work, you know, something very flexible, very easygoing. And, uh, and that was a huge project because it was, I had a team of four universities and we set it up for all of Switzerland. So basically the first year, I think it was seven university that carried out this event all on the same day, same evening. Wow. And, yeah. In parallel. So it was, you know, like a lot with sponsors, with the companies to get them involved. And so that was that. And then also I had the, the whole ETH event to set up. And um, that was a great experience, you know, for me in terms of the project management. Okay. What is, what is needed? How do you communicate with company representatives? But how do you communicate it with the cleaning stuff of the university? Because mm -hmm. they're essential. Okay, how do you communicate with caterers? How do you get them on board? And, you know, how do you, you know, manage? And I was so happy that first year to get 35 students to support you voluntarily. Wow. And that is all, you know, it's all about people. Yeah. So I build relationships and, and I do my best to keep them healthy because it all comes down to... Mm -hmm having good relationships. Let me ask you that, because when you describe your, your story, where you came from, that basically 
the first 11 years you were seen as not part of the country, the community, the culture, because you were the Germans. Then you moved to Germany and again, it was like, well, you're not German, you're different. How did you find a way to overcome this, I'm not part of, I don't belong, mm -hmm. to now saying it all boils down to relationships. I love working with people, bringing them together, um, generating some, some, a project or an event or a branding. How did you go from there to there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Um, I guess, you know, that has always been part of me because, you know, growing up in Romania also meant, surviving meant being flexible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting, like we've seen it now, even with the COVID situation is everybody speaks about solidarity. This is about people helping other people when it gets difficult right mm -hmm. and somehow i always managed to to find my place there's been there's been definitely situations where i fell out let's say of a place mm -hmm. and you know th there it was always this you know initial shock oh my this doesn't feel right anymore, right? And and then to realize, aha, maybe something in me changed, maybe a situation changed, right? So how do you deal with that? What do you do with that? And I think especially because I grew up, you know, with in this culture that it's always like, you know, we're this and we're in this. So we kind of like, I don't know if you know the, the history of, of the Saxonians. I mean, can you imagine that they kept their language, their dialect, their traditions for over 800 years? Wow. Okay, so my grandparents and my parents actually speak Saxonian. That is going back to an uh, old dialect in Luxembourg because that's where my family originally comes from, right? Um, so it's, it's almost this, you always keep a part of you, of who you are. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit of this trust, this confidence, and I couldn't name it. I still can't name it what it is. It's just this, yeah, you know, you have your place and, and then you have the relationship with others, right? Because in the end you can always just, I mean, you can recognize who you are by getting feedback from the others right mm -hmm. so you are in in constant exchange there is a action there is a reaction that's also quite interesting you know in the coaching context i guess when some people lost that when they don't have you know, that when they don't have a congruent view of like their inside view and the outside view, like how do they appear? How do they feel? You know, when there is the imbalance in these things. Mm -hmm. How do you help them to pull through that? By understanding who they are, but really basic, what makes them happy? What do they love doing? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, there is, there is different methods, you know, sometimes it means going back to, you know, growing up. What is it that made you happy? What is it that you did that, that you enjoyed? What did you spend most time with? Which are the things that you love to do today? And which are the things that you rather push away? Because I believe that a lot of people, you know, are stuck because they define themselves and it's funny you, you were one of them you know like i studied chemistry so i have to be a chemist and i have to be chemist for the rest of my life no you don't mm -hmm. so 
you know, in the end, I think by finding what it is by, you know, observing a bit, you know, working through what are the tasks that you like to do? What are the things that make you happy? Where is it that you feel most comfortable? Those are the things that you're strong in. How much of this are you using in your job? And if you realize you barely use any of them, you're in the wrong place. Because in the long term, you can do a lot with strength, with pure strength and dedication. But in the long term, you're not going to survive that. You're not going to be happy. And, and you know, I think it's, it's a constant, you know, like it's this, I just mm-hmm. think, right? It's this constant checking. Is that it? Is that still it? But especially now with this um, individual psychology, there is this test, uh, Grundrichtung der Persönlichkeiten. And there is this very, it's a very simple test. It has like four personalities mm-hmm. and um, 28 questions. And it's unbelievable how precise it is. And I've tried the test myself, I think at least five times. Because I try, it's like, oh, okay, let's see. I try a different day, a different situation. Try to, it, you know, a little bit, but not much. And, and that test also helped me now to understand better why I act a certain way. You know, why do I like these things more than I like these things? And that also helps. So have this awareness of what it is that you're good at, that makes you happy, that actually, you know, pulls you through. Can you, can you give one concrete example where you basically could connect the dots? Ah, that's the test result. Ah, now I understand why I'm reacting that way. Okay, and now I can do that. Either I continue on that path or I change it. Have you got one example present? I can tell you one thing. So from the test, there is this four types, right? So the first type is the busybody, okay? The doer. The second type is the consequence, right? It's all structured. It has to be this way. The third one is the friendly one. And the fourth one is the easygoing, comfortable one. By the way, all four are good. Mm-hmm. None of these is bad. It's just the awareness. So I'm definitely a busybody. <laughs> and I have a very strong friendly part, right? So the problem that I've had in the past was because I'm such a busybody, I like to do many things. You know, I do this project, I do this project, this, this project. But with the friendly, I'm struggling many times to say stop and no. So the awareness actually helps me to stop a step or two before I actually, you know, exhaust myself and I'm using up all my energy. So that was actually for me, and and just have it black on white, you know. I mean, there are certain situations described, or there are certain words um, to describe this different personality types, and they're not all fitting, but they don't have to be, right? But in the end, you always pick the ones that have to do something with yourself. Mm-hmm. So that for me, I have to say, it was, I knew it, but it wasn't so clear. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, ah, okay, step back. Do you really have to say that? I mean, the best example is, you know, we had the first um, parents conference, the first parents Mm -hmm. reunion, right? And the question was, who's going to be on the parents board, right? Mm -hmm. So me, busybody, I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. I can do that. And that was so great because I could sit down and say, okay, hold on a second, Ines. Let's see how many things I have. And I know how many things I have running, right? How many balls do I have in the air? Is that something that's really helpful? Because if I do it, you know, I want to do it right. Mm -hmm. And I want to be fully dedicated. 
So, you know how hard it was to just sit on my hands and not go, sure, I do it. It was so hard, but it was such a good decision. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's so small, right? And that's all that it is about. I think also in the coaching, you know, I'm not telling my customers, you're coming, we're going to work and you're going to walk out another person because I don't want them to change. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that in the end, it's more about recognizing, ah, oh, I really like doing this. No, I don't like doing this so much. Or this is the environment I need to strive. Mm -hmm. And this is something I can't deal with. Awareness actually helps to manage these kind of situation and take a decision mm -hmm. because it all comes down to the decision. So if you decide you want to stay in a situation that is not really helpful for you, it's a decision you're taking. And you are, I mean, that's what I'm telling my coaches is because that's this, this fear of taking a decision. What if it's the wrong one? Mm -hmm. Especially, you know, if you look at the personality types, the, the consequent one, that's the biggest fear is I'm taking a decision and it's the wrong decision. And because once I take a decision, I stick with it, you know, th th that's an issue, right? So, you know, to help people understand it's okay. You can take a decision and then you can take another one if you realize it's not fitting. And I'm not saying I'm deciding this and that and that, you know, if, if someone has that trait, of course, we have to look at why exactly uh -huh. <laughs> are you jumping back and forth, right? I think what happens with awareness is that at least we get to choose what traits of us we are running. It's not anymore it's running us. Yeah. But no, I decide, I mean, if you had raised your hand, it would have been the decision out of the values that you have, out of um, the life situation that you have at that moment, the, the time management resources that you have at that moment to say, I would like to do that. But it's kind of a conscious decision or not to raise and not right. just it happens. It's just like, Sometimes when coaches come, it's like, how the hell did that happen? How did I end up where I'm like, well, I don't know, but you definitely took a few turns there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that being aware. And then, like you say, either deciding to continue and to be miserable out of whatever reasons there might be, but at least, you know, or to take the decision to change. Yeah. And I like when you say, um, you know, that taking a decision is not the end of, you know, it's not like a right or wrong. That's always what I tell them. It's like, hey, not taking a decision is also a decision yeah. you have to be aware of that, of the Absolutely. consequences of not deciding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is hard, you know, because you're facing <laughs> adversity. You know, you have a family that may be shocked. What are you talking about? You decided you're going to do that. You know, it's, it's your, maybe in a construct of people already, they all started. You don't want to miss out there, but you know, that, that is, I mean, it's a good thing that you just took seven years. You know, <laughs> I think sometimes, you know, what about people that reach 40, 45? I, mean, I don't want to call it the midlife crisis, but mm -hmm. I think sometimes thank god there is something like this midlife crisis because then people can wake up and and sometimes it takes a crisis you know sometimes it takes this i'm exhausted i can't go on like this anymore to actually start looking at it right and uh yeah i mean also like like you said this thing about not taking a decision is taking a decision yeah you know to just realize for some people aha uh -huh, I'm being the victim, always others take decisions, but what is my part in that? Mm -hmm. You know, I allow that because I get something from it. Now, Adler talks about the, the, uh, the, the, the subconscious goal, right? There is some goal, like this, this people get something out of this, right? 
Yeah. In NLP, we're saying whatever we do, there's always a positive intention behind it. Yeah. Uh, it might not be visible, but yeah. there's always a positive intention. So it's, it's very much similar to what, what Adler says. Um, Ines, I usually finish off with one question. And that question is, was there a question that you would have liked me to ask that I didn't? I think one thing we didn't speak about is why in the end I took the decision to finally get my own business started. The interesting part of it is, you know, I'm a career coach, but I never actually planned my career. Um, I think the older I got, I started planning a bit more. I'm a good project manager that includes a lot of planning, but interestingly, it didn't, you know, it did never occur to, to my life plan. Right. And, um, and I think that, you know, there is this, this fear of most of us, you know, that what if I don't have an aim? What's the ultimate goal in my life? What is it that I actually want to achieve? There's been this exercise, it's almost, you know, like if you would look back, if you were old now, look back, what is it that you would have liked to do and you didn't do it? So you get the chance to do them now. Don't wait so long, right? And I always had this idea about, you know, being my own boss, being independent to, to live out, you know, this, this part of me, you know, this flexibility, this, yeah, just oh, being that. And then, you know, about this. exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, combining all this parts, but I think it was also to, to have this flexibility and I've taken so many decisions, but this decision was always a hard one. And, and I, I wouldn't say I took it easily and I have, I have to also admit that if I didn't go through the family situation that I had four years ago where I lost my sister to suicide, mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would be where I am today. And What I want to say with that is, you know, it took me almost four years, you know, to then decide, okay, I do that. And it started rolling the ball of, you know, um, first it was, I mean, I was, I was basically home with a six week old newborn, right. Um, when, when I lost my sister and it was this, you know, I was in the, in the mode of, survival you just do you just take care you just manage the family you take care of everything etc cetera, etc cetera. and then um i all of a sudden very surprisingly was pregnant with the second one <laughs> that was not planned and i was very overwhelmed and and then i realized uh wow it's like you know i pushed back a lot of my own things you know the the whole morning phase just never really happened for me because i was in this just manage everything right and um and then my second son was born and unfortunately he he had some health issues and he went through two surgeries at nine weeks and then we as a family you know we were a month in hospital in and out and and i came to a point you know i I felt like, oh my God, every, I always step further back, further back. I just manage, manage, manage. And, um, and then I went back to work and I realized I can't hold these balls all in the air at the same time anymore because of who I am. I'm very passionate and I'm very dedicated. And it was never a question for me to not go back to work because I loved my job. You know, it was, I mean, ETH is such a great environment. You know, there is great people and, and the team was great and everything. But then I just came, I had to physically also come to the point where I realized I can't manage everything anymore, right? So to take that decision was very hard. And I wish sometimes I, I wouldn't push so hard so far, you know? 
that's that's something I would love to you know that's it also makes me understand others very well because I am very sensible to others when it comes to you know pushing hard how long do you want to go and I was very, you know, I had times where I was very angry. I was angry with life. I was angry that I lost my sister. I was angry I lost her that way. I was angry. We couldn't do more to help. It's not a feeling of guilt. It's not that. But it was also angry at myself of why am I waiting so long to take these decisions? Life is just, it's here. It's now. It's today, right? So not to wait too long to actually decide for yourself Mm -hmm. for what is actually good for you. Why do you think, I mean, for you so easily taking decisions, why do you think that decision was so difficult for you? What stopped you from doing it sooner? I mean, you know, with the job, I've been eight years with ETH. Mm -hmm. It was a great environment, as I said, you know, it's, it's this thing. It was the rationality of it. Why would I give that up? I like that. Um, You know, it's, it's one of this, like not letting go. It maybe was the fear as well, you know, because I actually quit my job without anything. Mm -hmm. without having this clear idea it was there but for me it was the first decision was priority is my family Mm -hmm. all this matters right and and i wonder today why did i wait so long you know i mean it started with realizing through the loss of my sister wow family is all that matters to me i'm a very strong family person but there was probably a a fear oh i'm missing out you know i'm i'm just quitting this great job and then what if i'm not going to be happy what if i what if what if what if what if and the what if maybe might never come right well, what if you are successful? What if you do find um, the right clients? What if you flourish in the business? What if you are actually successful and happy with what you will be doing? Yeah, exactly. That's the side of what if. Exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, what I realized is I waited, I exhausted myself too long to actually be able to see this positives. And I think that was something that, yeah, I would have done differently, Mm -hmm. you know, looking back. And sometimes it has to hurt. It has to hurt really hard to take a decision like this. And sometimes I believe it doesn't have to. If you have the consciousness and if you're aware of, aha, I'm... I'm scared of this and this and that. Yeah, but is that really something that might become true? What about this other thing? So you you have a better position to take a decision like that out of that kind of a situation. And I think that's one thing that you help your clients with. Yeah. It's it's not having to do that thinking process on your own. I think that is the big benefit to sit down with you. Um, in terms of like, get the outside perspective, get somebody telling you, hey, you, you're just going down there, come back, come back. Exactly. Let's make conscious what is important to you, what makes you happy, um, what makes you smile when you get up in the morning. Mm-hmm. You know? Or maybe you're not a smiley person in the morning, but it's okay. Communicating to your family mm-hmm. or to your team, this is how I am. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, please, you know, please, can you leave me be until I had my first tea? I don't know, you know, maybe it's just that. Yeah. Ines, I could be talking forever <laughs> with you. <laughs> I would like to thank you. Thank you. That you came. Thank you for inviting me. It was really a pleasure talking to you, Anya. <laughs>